And Lord God, we thank you for the blessings of another day. We thank you for the te technology that allows us to uh, gather as we have on Zoom. I thank you for all the prayers that have been offered up to you and that will be. And now as we come once again to your word, we do ask that you open our eyes, grant that we may behold wondrous things in your word, and then give us understanding, and then uh, grant us the grace to be doers of the word and not hearers only. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. We've been talking about uh, provisions of God for the elect, um, provisions for their uh, salvation. Uh, salvation is not automatic. Uh, people are chosen to be saved. It's the elect are chosen to be saved. They're not saved. They're chosen to be saved. And and I, I gave you some scriptures that make that clear. Um uh, the main one would probably be First Thessalonians. But anyway, I'd like to start tonight to look at some provisions that God has made for the perseverance of the saints. And that is uh, the security of the believer. Uh, you know, once you're saved, uh, God has made provisions that, that, that we will stay saved. Um, and, and the provisions that he has, has made uh, for that, things that he does and things that, uh, that we do. Um, and so uh, one of the provisions that God has made is, is in John chapter 10. Um, we have actually double coverage. Uh, John chapter 10 and uh, verses uh, 27 through 29. John 10, 27 through 29. And here we're going to see double coverage double coverage verse 27 my sheep hear my voice and i know them and they follow me and i give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish they shall never perish and uh, uh never uh, translates a double negative you know most of you know what double negatives mean in greek it's uh ooh, actually you have two words ume uh, but when when it when when the translators translate it over in English, they'll never give you double negatives because we don't have double negatives in English. Uh, and, and if we, if we if the translator were to translate the double negative literally, it would be never never or not not. And so I give unto them e eternal life; it's a gift, and they shall never double negative. And parish is in the middle voice. We don't have middle voices in English. And a middle voice is a, a well, the passive uh, active voice means the subject is performing the action. Passive voice means the subject is receiving the action. A middle voice verb in Greek means that the subject is doing both. The subject is both uh, performing the action and receiving the action. So it's an action performed by the subject on itself. It's like something that the subject does to itself. And so when Jesus says they will never perish, this means they can't they, they will never perish themselves they will never uh well i'll put it this way some i've heard people say that uh, no one can take you out of god's hand uh but you can take yourself out well the fact that this verb is in the middle voice means that you you can't take yourself out um even if you were crazy enough to to try to do that you you, you won't do it and and then jesus goes on to say my father, which gave the, well, no, the, the last clause in verse 28. I'll read the whole verse again, but I'm interested in the last clause. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Now, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. No one can take them out of my hand. And then in verse 29 of John 10, my father who gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hands. And so the elect are in the hands of Jesus and they're in the hands of God the Father. So it's like double coverage. And uh, this is a, a provision that God has made for the perseverance or the security of the believer. They, uh, they have, the believer has uh, double coverage. And uh, then in John chapter 17, we won't turn there. We looked at it earlier in our study. On, on, uh, in the Gospel of John is where Jesus uh, tells, you know, in his prayer, in his intercessory prayer, he points out the uh, those that you gave me, I have kept them. 
And now I'm, I'm asking you to keep them. And of all of those that you gave me, I kept them all except the son of perdition, Judas, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And uh, and then uh, First Peter, we won't turn there, but First Peter chapter one, verses three and five. Uh, Peter there uh, talks about the elect being kept, and so there's double coverage. Number two, uh, God has provided the, the sealing of the Holy Spirit, the sealing of the Holy Spirit, and and in e Ephesians chapter one, verses thirteen to fourteen, you have there the work of God the Father in our salvation, and you have the work of God the Son and our salvation, and then the work of God, the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is, is he seals us until the day of redemption, that is the redemption of the body. And so there's a, there's a seal placed up on us, uh, which indicates ownership. And we have things probably in our homes where we have them stamped, or there's some type of uh, mark on them that, uh, you know, that that will have our name on it and uh, yeah, it's, it's like a, it's like a seal which, which means ownership and um, and it's interesting to note that as Paul gives these descriptions like of the work of God the Father Ephesians uh, uh, 1 uh, 3 through I believe it's 4 or 5 uh, he ends it with the um, with with uh, the refrain and he does this three times after each description to the praise of the glory of his grace, the praise of the glory of his grace. So after describing the uh, work of God, the father, uh, he says it, he, it was for God's glory, the work of God, the son for his glory, work of God, the Holy Spirit for his glory. And so our salvation, uh, we've been talking about uh, the glory of God and uh, motives uh, for, for glorifying God uh, or reasons. And, and one is the, the, the fact that uh, God saved us uh, for His His glory. That is the reason that He that He that He saved us, and and that's a motive for glorifying Him. Is that He saved us for that purpose? That's why He saves us. One of the reasons that He saved us is uh, for His is for His glory, and we lead others to Christ. So here's there will be another voice that will glorify that will glorify God, and so Ephesians chapter one verses thirteen through fourteen. And uh, you have the sealing of the Holy Spirit, but also you have the work of God, the Father, God, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. And then number three, Jesus is interceding for us in Romans chapter 8, verses 33 through 39. Romans chapter 8, verses 33 through uh, 39. Uh, who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Um, Jesus is interceding for us constantly. He's, he's interceding for us. And also in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, Hebrews 7, 25, we're told there also that Jesus is interceding for us. And so this is another provision that, that God has made for our security or our uh, perseverance. And then number four, uh, God has provided confession. I mean, we, you know, God knew that we would, would, with sin. He knew that the elect, you know, we, we were sin. I mean, there's just so many ways in which we can sin. We can sin by what we see, uh, by, by what we say, rather. We can sin by what we say. We can sin by what we do. We can sin by what we don't say, what we don't do that we're, we're supposed to do or call upon to do. So any, any uh, violation or disobedience to a command of God uh, is, is sin. God tells us to make disciples. I mean, and, and, and we need to confess these things. that I, I haven't obeyed the command uh, to make disciples. We're commanded to forgive one another, to pray for one another, to encourage one another. There's just so many things that, that we're commanded to do. But uh, we don't lose our, our salvation and so on uh, when we, we fail to do uh, some of these things because God has provided, has made provision for us to, to confess these things to him. And uh, the ACTS acronym, uh, A-C-T-S, and, and, and the C is for, con is for confession. And so confession is something that we should do. In fact, every time we, 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 we do our daily prayers, uh, we should confess. I mean, there's always something to confess, something that we should have done that we didn't do or something that we did that we should not have done. And, uh, and so it's, it's important to confess that. And God has made that provision uh, for us. That's, a, that's one of the... Um, uh, provisions.
provision that God has made for our perseverance. And the uh, two, two scriptures uh, uh, for this point uh, are Proverbs 28, 13, if he that uh, covers his sin will not prosper, but whosoever confess and forsake them will have mercy. In 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then number five, God has provided uh, repentance uh, for the elect. I mean, you know, this is a part of salvation. It's also a part of preservation. Recognize, repent, return. And, uh, and, and, and so this is another uh, provision that God has made for the provision of the elect. And then, and this is a very important one, that God has provided divine discipline divine discipline and uh, this is a uh, another provision that god has made for the perseverance of the elect is divine discipline and uh out then there are a number of scriptures here if you're taking notes uh, i've given you these scriptures before but i give them to you again and, and and i'll go slowly job chapter five verse in fact i'll repeat them three times how's that job 5 17 Job 5.17, Job 5.17, Psalm 94.12, Psalm 94.12, Psalm 94.12, Proverbs 3.11 and 12, Proverbs 3.11 and 12, Proverbs 3.11 and 12. Hebrews 12, chapter 12, verses 3, 3, 11. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 3, 3, 11. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 3, 3, 11. And there's, there's one of these I'll we'll look at. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. And proof of divine discipline, or some examples, I should say. There are a number of examples of divine discipline in the Bible. But in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, uh, where you have Ananias and Sapphira, uh, lying, and, uh, and, and, and God took their lives. It, and it, was, it was divine discipline. Um, uh, Acts chapter 5, 1 through 11. Acts 5, 1 through 11. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 28 through 32. Now, everyone should be familiar with this passage because I read it from time to time in relation to our communion service. And uh, in fact, even though we, we all should be familiar with them, I read them all the time, these verses, that is. Uh, I'm going to read them again. I'll just read them again. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And here we see that divine discipline may include sickness and even death. Uh, and, and we we have to be careful now about somebody, you know, somebody gets sick or whatever, and and we jump to the conclusion that they've committed some great sin and God is disciplining them. We have to be careful with, with, with that. Uh, that many times is not the case. But uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Verse 29, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, because of the way that they're coming to the, the Lord's table, it's the manner in which they're coming to the Lord's table coming without taking care of sin, coming without confessing their sins, and uh, just a lot of things were going on in the church at Corinth. Verse 30, For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. And sleep is a euphemism, a euphemism for death. Some of you are, are dying. Now, and, and I believe, based upon this, these two verses that I just read to, to you, is that I believe a, there a lot of people died prematurely who were believers, who were, who were believers. And they were, were continued to practice a sin. I mean, they just 
uh, continued. No repentance and no confession. And before God will allow a person to lose his or her salvation, he will, he'll call, he'll bring them home. And I believe that there are a lot of people who died prematurely, a lot of people who call home uh, because God did it so that they wouldn't lose their salvation. Because, in, in fact, Paul goes on to say, I should have read a few more verses in what I read. He said, many are weakly and sickly among you, many sleep. And uh, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord so that we will not be condemned with the world. And so God chastens us so that we won't be condemned with the world. And you look at the context, we see that chastening may involve sickness and even death. And this is one of the uh, main reasons why, well, I shouldn't say main reason, there are a lot of good reasons why uh, you cannot lose your salvation if you have it. Now that, and that's the question. And, and, and before you try to convince somebody that they can't lose their salvation, let them prove to you that they have it. And, uh, and, and salvation is proved by, by fruits. Jesus says in Matthew uh, chapter seven, you will know them by their fruits. And, uh, and I gave you a list of, uh, of things uh, last Sunday that the Bible calls uh, fruits, um, good works, uh, uh, character, you know, the fruit of the spirit, and uh, so on, uh, uh, conversation, you know, how you talk, and, and, and so on. So I, I gave you at least six different uh, things that... Uh, the Bible calls fruits, and I'm I, I did, I'm sure there's a I like sevens <laughs> when I'm giving out a list like that, and uh, so I've got to find one more. So I'll have a I'll have a seven, and I know there's one there. I just haven't found it yet. Uh, but you'll know them by their their fruit. And please notice, not by their gifts. In Matthew chapter seven, you, Jesus, said, you'll know them by their fruits, not by their gifts, because Jesus, uh, you know, goes on to say in Matthew chapter seven. Uh, 20, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in our name? Gift. We've cast out devils in your name. We've done many wonderful works in your name. And Jesus will say, verse 23, uh, depart from me, I never knew you, gnosko, which I, I never, there never was an intimate love relationship. Now, here's a passage I'd like you to ponder in relation to divine discipline and i guess perhaps the best two verses uh, uh are passages i should say because in hebrews it's, it's more than one verse but in hebrews the uh, uh passage that i gave you chapter 12 verses 3 through 11 please look at that as an assignment uh and you might want to look at it in different different translations maybe the uh New Living Translation, but look at it and it and, and what God points out there, what what stands out, is those that I love, I discipline. Those that I love, that I discipline, and then a Revelation, Revelation chapter three, and verse nineteen. I I told you that I would read a a, pass, a passage, and this is the one I want to read, and this is one to to ponder, Revelation three nineteen. And Jesus is speaking here, and he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten or discipline. Be zealous, therefore, <laughs> and repent. <laughs> and he's talking to the church. He's not talking to non-believers. He's talking to believers. He's talking to the church. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Now, what the, here's the thing to ponder here is if he loves everybody the same, if he loves everybody the same, then this verse makes no sense. Those that I love, I rebuke and chasten. Now, is Jesus rebuking and chasing everybody? Is he rebuking and chasing everybody? And the same thing in, in Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, God says, if you are with, if you're without divine discipline, you don't belong to me. One of the evidences that you belong to me is I will discipline you. And, and sometimes we see people and we, you know, we wonder why, why isn't God disciplining them? If they're true, if they belong to God, why isn't God disciplining them? And, and, it's, and, and it's true that God is long suffering. He's patient with, with, uh, with people. And that's in uh, uh, Romans chapter two, uh, 
Second Peter chapter three, I believe it's verse 18. A God is long suffering toward us to give us an opportunity to, to repent. That's why God is long suffering. God is long suffering right now with the nations, especially America. And why, is, why does he do that? To provide an opportunity to repent. And it's, 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 it's frightening to me when God provides all these opportunities to repent and, and, and instead of the nation getting better, it, get, it gets worse. I mean, it gets worse. I mean, sin is is being is legalized. <laughs> sin, a whole month is dedicated to to taking pride in sin. Can you can you imagine what does God think about that? What does God think about that? He delays. You know, he's 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 he's, he's he is uh, long suffering to give people an opportunity to repent, and instead of repenting, they get worse. They get worse. On the, but just ponder this. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. He does not rebuke and chasten everybody, which means that he does not love everybody the same. There is a general love. There's a common love that, that God has for everybody, that Jesus has for everybody. There's a common grace that God gives to, to everybody, a common grace. He makes the rain to fall on the wicked and the, the just and the unjust. He makes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. All right. But, but he does not give restraining grace to everybody. If he did, we would not have the craziness that's going on in the world today. Everybody, everyone doesn't get restraining grace. Everyone doesn't get saving grace. Everyone doesn't get suffering grace. Everyone doesn't get speaking grace. I mean, you have a list of the graces, or should have. I put them on the on the information table. A list of the different, the special graces, and and those special graces are not given to everyone. If they were, again, the world would be different. But thank God that He has given to us saving grace. He's given to us restraining grace, and and different graces He has given unto, un, unto us. And uh, so, so read those. Now, the sovereignty of God, the election of God, does not cancel human responsibility. God's election, God's sovereignty, does not cancel human responsibility. And two of the best illustrations in the Bible in my opinion, that I'm aware of, of the balance between the sovereignty of God and human responsibility is in Nehemiah chapter 4 and in uh, Acts chapter 27. I'll let you read the Acts passage, but the, the one in, in uh, Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 9. And, and what I want us to see in these verses that I'm going to read is the balance between the sovereignty of God, and human responsibility. Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 9. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch. They watched and prayed. They set a watch and they prayed against them day and night because of them. Now, I'm, I'm assuming that most of you know the context here of, of, uh, of Nehemiah, is that Nehemiah has returned uh, to uh, Jerusalem to rebuild the walls, and uh, they're working on the walls, but they have enemies that, that uh, the enemies are seeking to stop the work and so on. And so they, they, they pray, but at the same time, they watch. They didn't just pray, they watched. They didn't just watch, they prayed. And then in um, uh, Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. And it came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants worked in the work and the other half of them held both the spears and the shields and the bows 
and the hydrogens and the rulers were behind all of the houses of Judah. They which built on the wall and they that or they that bear burdens were those that laden every one with one of the hands wrought in the work and with the other hand held a weapon. For the builders, every one had his sword guarded or girded by his side and so built it. And he that sounded the trumpet was by him. So now, if, if you read these, these, these verses here, you'll, you'll see clearly, and you can read them in the different translations, the, maybe the New Living Translation. But you'll see there's a, there's a neat balance here. And please read um, in Acts chapter uh, 27, God appeared to Paul and said, you know, fear not. Uh, uh, everybody on the ship, they're in a storm. They're in a storm. And uh, and God told Paul is you know don't fear is no no lives are going to be lost and so on and uh, God has given you all of these people that's sailing with you which I believe means that they're they're going to get saved as a result of this storm and I'm sure Paul was praying for their salvation uh, but uh, but but Paul said that uh, you know fear not eat some food uh, you know the ship is going to run aground and so on but we all are going to be saved. And then there were some of the uh, uh, sailors that were trying to get off the ship and secretly. And Paul said to the uh, centurion, the, the, the Roman soldier that was in, in charge of everything, he said, we can't be saved if these don't stay on the ship. And so you got him saying, we're all going to be saved. Don't fear not. Don't worry about anything. And then on the other hand, he says that if these don't stay on the ship, we can't be saved. You see. And so, in other words, if you read that carefully, you just what I want to see as you read it is the balance between the sovereignty of God and human responsibility. Now, God, just as God has provided, He's made He's made provisions for our perseverance, for perseverance. But then there are things that we are to do for our perseverance. I mean, you don't let go and let God. In some areas, you do that, but in many areas, you don't. And I want to give you some examples. I want to at least start to give you some examples. And I'll give you as, 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 as well, probably, I'll probably just give you, I won't have time to give you more than one. And I want to give you this one because it's our memory verse for Sunday. And, and we are, we're commanded to grow in grace. You know, we, God has made provisions for our perseverance and grace is the provision for our perseverance and again our memory verse for sunday second peter chapter 3 verse 18 but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ to him be glory both now and forevermore grow translates a greek verb that number one is in the imperative mood it is a command. We are commanded. See, here again, you know, we, we talk about confessing sins. I mean, what did we do? What, 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 what did we do today or yesterday to grow in grace? What, what contribution did we make to what I, it's a command. It's in the imperative mood. And the verb is in the active voice. Which means you don't let you don't let go and let God. You you there's some things you, that we must do. The verb is in the active voice, and it is in the present tense, which means continuous action in the, the present. It means it's it's a way of life. It is a lifestyle, and so this is to be a lifestyle. This is to be a way of life that we are seeking to grow in grace. And growing in grace is is, uh, is is unmerited favor. And, and if we're growing in grace, when we are gracious to other people, that's how you know whether or not you're growing in grace. Is when you can forgive somebody who crosses you. And when you can say some kind words to someone who does not deserve it. That's what grace is. If you give, when you give people what they deserve, that's not grace. 
Grace means you are giving somebody something they don't deserve, something that they haven't earned. And, and that's one of the ways, one of the indicators that you're growing in grace. You know, on your job, as you're driving, are you gracious when you drive? Are you gracious on your job? The people that cross you, the people that get on your nerves, the people that drive you up a wall. Are you gracious? That's how you know you're growing in grace. <laughs> That's how you know. And we're commanded to grow in grace. Grow in speaking grace. Uh, our, our memory verse for last Sunday. Uh, or this month. If it was, uh, anyway, this month. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace to the hearers. And in Colossians, we're told there, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. Okay. And, and so we're, we're, we're to grow in grace. And, and some of the means, how, how do we, how, and, and I don't, you know, many times we tell people what to do, but then we don't tell them how to do it. And so how do you grow in grace? How do you grow? How do you grow in grace? And, and I'll give you a couple of ways to grow in, grow in grace. And we're commanded to grow in grace. And one of the ways we grow in grace is by humbling ourselves. Humility, hum, humbling ourselves. Uh, James chapter four, verse six, God gives grace to the humble. God gives grace to the humble, James four, six. And Philippians chapter two, verse five, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form, the morphe of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form, the morphe of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. In humility, this is something that we do. He humbled himself and became obedient, even to the point of death. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name that at the name of Jesus, Every knee should bow. Every tongue should confess. Uh, things in heaven, things in earth, things on the earth, and every, every, everyone should confess that Jesus Christ is kurios, master, lord, uh, ruler. And uh, four, there were there were four continuing activities of the early church. I mention them all the time. Acts chapter two, verse forty-two. Four continuing activities. And these are means of grace. God has provided grace and he has provided means of grace. The word of God is a means of grace. The word of God is a mean of, means of grace. And this was one of the continuing activities of the early church. And it's, it's first on the list. And uh, the reason that it's first on the list, as I've uh, been pointing out, is that, uh, and, and, and with those four uh, main purposes that God has for the church, the very first one is 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 education. The other Sunday, I told you no education is last, but it it's really I I told you earlier that it's first, and uh, it is first. And the reason that education is first is because you have to be educated. You know, like glorifying. We've been talking about glorifying God, and uh, you have well education, glorification, edification, and evangelization. Well, you have to be educated to know how to do all of those. You have to be educated to know. What is the glory of God? Why should we glorify God? And how do we glorify God? That's education. Uh, edification, building up one another, encouraging one another. How do you do that? Well, we do it. One of the ways that we do it is by practicing the one another in the commands, the one another injunction. Love one another, forgive one another, be kind to one another, pray for one another, encourage one another, admonish one another, and so on. And, and so these are a means of grace. Well, first, you have the word, the word of God. That's a means of grace. And then fellowship. Fellowship is a means of grace. Interacting with other, other believers. And uh, you see, you, you're not going to learn how to love the way that God commands us to love unless you got some unlovable people to practice on. And God is so good. He gives all of us somebody <laughs> to practice on. Isn't that good? You don't have to go out looking. And you don't have to pray, Lord, I want to practice. I want to practice forgiving. Lord, I want to practice <laughs> loving. <laughs> oh, Lord, 
No, you don't have to pray that. Just go to your job. <laughs> you know, and just go among your family members. And uh, just go to church. <laughs> just go to church. You know, somewhere, there's, there's, there's going to be somebody in church. You know, I thank God for our fellowship. You know, our friendship and all of that and all of that and all, you know, and all that. But at the same time, there's going to be somebody. If you stay around long enough, there will be somebody that you're going to get a chance to practice on. Okay? Uh, uh, being kind, being gracious, uh, forgiving, and uh, and so on, and, and, and on your job, okay? And and uh, uh, God, without faith, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. God wants us to grow, and God wants everybody to grow in the likeness of Jesus Christ, to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, you, you know, usually we stop at verse 28 without reading the context. Uh, but all things are working together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purposes. And uh, in verse 29, verses 29 and 30, that, you know, that we might be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And so God is working all of these things together so that we will be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Now, the tools that God uses, God, God uses tools. Just the devil uses tools. God uses tools also. And uh, 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 Jeremiah talks about the potter's wheel. Some of us are on the potter's wheel. Malachi talks about the refiner's fire. Some of us are in the refiner's fire. And, and when the potter puts the clay on the wheel, he works with it until he, he gets it the way he wants it. And when it doesn't shape up, he has to crush it and start all over again. And the uh, refiner, I understand when the refiner puts the substance, gold, silver, or whatever, into the fire, he, ha he has to get the heat just right. Uh, he's not going to get uh, rid of the impurities if the heat is not hot enough and he could damage damage it if it's too hot. So it has to be just right. And the way he knows that the substance has been removed and that it's time to take the substance out of the fire is when he can see a reflection of himself in that substance. And so some of us are on the potter's wheel. Some of us are in the refiner's fire. And then you have uh, John, uh, chapter uh, 15 talks about the divine dresser <laughs> and and the uh, divine dresser he prunes he cuts away the dead branches and uh i remember my, my wife we have a rose bush the people that did our landscaping you know out of this big house he puts a beautiful rose bush on the side of the house where nobody sees it except me when i mow the lawn <laughs> it's beautiful rose bush on the, can you imagine this in the in the on the set? This beautiful rose bush. It's not in the front where people can see it. It is on the side of the house. But anyway, and my wife rarely saw it because it, it wasn't in the front of the house. It wasn't in the back of the house. It was on the side of the house. And, but anyway, she saw me cutting it, trimming it, pruning it, and she got all upset. She thought I was destroying her bush. But no, I, I'm just making it uh, more fruitful by getting rid of these dead branches. All right. And God does that with us. And so some of us will be pruned. And then in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, <laughs> Peter talks about the stone mason. mason you know, it's, he pictures us there as, as living stone. And God is, is, is chipping away. You know, he, he's shaping. It's like we're in a quarry. And uh, like when the temple was built, um, all of the stones for the temple were shaped outside of the city. In fact, some of you may have been with me. I, I, I request, and when I did my uh, tours of Israel, I would always put at least two or three places on there that I had not been before. And uh, one uh, tour, I wanted to see this stone quarry and we went inside of it. We, we did a tour of it. It's not too far from the garden tomb. Uh, you, and, and we always do the garden tomb. Well, the, the, the quarry where they did this, the stones for the temple, it's not too far from the garden tomb. Uh, but my, my point is that 
is that the uh, masons they 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 uh, shaped the stones in the quarry so there would be no noise on, on the temple site where the temple was built. And the temple was built. Uh, those of you who've been to Israel, you know you, you did the uh, Whaling Wall or the Western Wall. It was a retaining wall for the for the temple, and that's one of the most sacred places in all the world for for Jews, you know, Orthodox Jews is is the Whaling Wall or the or, or the Western Wall. But but these these stones were shaped, and uh, and and God is 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 like a mason. He's shaping us so that we fit into this temple that He is building. Read First uh, 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 Peter chapter two. I, I gotta preach it sometime. Uh, but th this is the takeaway: is that God wants our faith to grow. God wants us to develop in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God is using a tool to do that. You can call that tool the refiner's fire. You can call it the potter's wheel. You can call it pruning, vine dresser. Uh, you can call it stone maser. But God is using a tool. Now, here's what to, 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 to take away. The tool that God is using may be your job. The tool that God is using may be someone in the fellowship. The tool that God is using may be your spouse, maybe your children or your child or your grandchildren. And so I'd like you to think about it tonight and this week is what tool is God using to shape me into the image of Jesus Christ? And once you understand that, I think that you'll relate to that tool differently. And remember, God is going to stop chipping away when the stone shakes up. God is going to take you out of the fire when he can see a reflection of himself. God is going to take you off the wheel <laughs> when, you shape, when you shape up. I, said, I want to leave you with that. I want to just leave you, leave you with that. that that's, that's, hopefully that's a rainbow for all of you. All right, Lord God, we thank you for our time together tonight. We thank you for the richness of your word. We thank you for how it speaks to us. We thank you for how practical it is and how relevant it is. And now I pray your blessings upon the hearers. Uh, grant us the grace to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Grant us the grace, Lord, to daily walk in the steps you've ordered for us. Grant us the grace to take advantage of every opportunity that you provide for us to glorify you, and for us to witness to others the good news of the gospel. And now, in Jesus' name, I pray. And now the Arianic blessing, Yevar Rekka Adonai V'yishmerika. Ya'er Adonai Panav Eleka V'kunekam. Yisa Adonai Panav Eleka V'yasim Deka. Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. I know you're going to be praying for me at my uh, sabbatical. Uh, number one, I have a lot that I want to get to do, to do, but I want to enjoy the journey. I want to stay fresh and I want to stay face to face and I want to stay feel. I still want to do those things and I will be still, I don't take a vacation from praying from you, for you. Mm -hmm. I'll still be praying for you after midnight. I, I don't take a vacation. I take mm -hmm. a vacation from a lot of other things, but not, not from that. So just know that mm -hmm. I'll be praying for you every day. All right. Shalom to all of you. Shalom. Shalom. Thank you so much, Pastor. <laughs>